You're listening to the FQXI podcast. Today. We can't imagine nature without time flowing through it. But on the most fundamental level, physicists aren't even sure whether time exists at all. It may just be an illusion. Miriam Frankel explores the nature of time with the help of Sean Carroll. Time is a coordinate on space-time. It doesn't flow as a fundamental feature any more than space flows. We have an impression that time flows because entropy is increasing, which gives us the arrow of time, whereas there's no arrow of space. Emily Adlam. But there are other ways the laws of nature could be. They could be more like the rules of a game of Sudoku. And Natalia Ares. And we have some tools to understand thermodynamics of machines and the limitations that govern those machines. So by understanding clocks as machines, there are things that we can understand better about what are the limits of time keeping in terms of thermodynamic resources. I'm Zia Morali. Welcome to the podcast from the Foundational Questions Institute, where today we're bringing you the first part of Great Mysteries of Physics, a series produced in partnership with The Conversation and hosted by Miriam Frankel. In this first edition, Miriam explores puzzles surrounding the nature of time. Is time an illusion? Does it flow? Do we live in a Sudoku universe? And why does time march in only one direction? She's helped out by physicists Sean Carroll of Johns Hopkins University, Emily Adlam of Western University, and Natalia Ares of Oxford University. So, over to Miriam and the conversation for episode one. Great Mysteries of Physics is a series supported by FQXI, the Foundational Questions Institute, a think tank and funding agency that explores the foundations and boundaries of science. Find out more at fqxi.org. Welcome to Great Mysteries of Physics from The Conversation. I'm Miriam Frankel, and I'll be your host for the series. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, it might have seemed that there was nothing new to discover in physics. Not anymore. It's increasingly clear that there are problems that physics, at least as we know it, cannot solve. Perhaps we just need more data. Or perhaps we need a whole new theory of reality. This podcast series will take you on a mind-blowing journey from the smallest particle to the very boundaries of existence, exploring hidden dimensions, the secrets of consciousness and parallel universes along the way. We'll reveal the greatest mysteries facing physics today and investigate the radical possible solutions. So let's begin with time. As without time, there can be no beginning. Can there? We can't imagine nature without time flowing through it. But on the most fundamental level, Physicists aren't even sure whether time exists at all. It may just be an illusion. Scientists long assume that time is absolute and universal, so the same for everyone everywhere, and existing independently of us. Newton's famous equations of motions, which are referred to as classical physics, for example, have a factor t in them for time, so that any physical process can be described at any time, fast-forwarded from a few given initial conditions. Newton's universe ran like clockwork. While he believed that God had created the universe, it sort of followed that his perfect machine would thereafter tick on predictably with its future written at its start through some starting conditions. But Einstein's theories of relativity, which describe nature at the largest of scales, turn Newton's universe on its head. They show that time is interwoven with space into what he called space-time. They also unveiled that time is relative rather than absolute. It can speed up or slow down depending on how fast you're travelling, for example. 
The theory enabled scientists to picture the universe in a whole new way as a static four-dimensional block with three spatial dimensions, so height, width and depth, and time as a fourth. This block contains all of space and time simultaneously, and time doesn't seem to flow. There is no special now. What appears to be the present to one observer is the past to another. And this suggests that we don't really move through time from past to future, even if it feels like there is an arrow of time going forward. But that's not the end of the model. Einstein's view of time itself seemed to clash with quantum mechanics, which describes the microcosmos of atoms and particles. In this theory, just as in Newton's classical mechanics, time is absolute, always ticking in the background. Although remarkably, one interpretation of the theory, called retrocausality, suggests the future could influence the past. And so quantum mechanics and general relativity simply aren't compatible with one another, particularly over the matter of time. In fact, when physicists try to unite them into a quantum gravity type of theory of everything, time seems to just vanish from the equations. Confused yet? What's really going on? Is the smooth flow of time we experience simply a quirk of how the human brain works? Or does it emerge when you look at nature on the macroscopic scale of humans? Take temperature. We all experience it, but a fundamental particle can't actually have temperature. It instead emerges on the level of many molecules moving collectively. And perhaps it's the same with time. It clearly flows from our perspective, but... It may not do so on the most fundamental scale. That's what we'll explore in this episode, along with some of the approaches to solving it. Sean Carroll is Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy at John Hopkins University in the US. His research focuses on foundational questions in cosmology, and he has written multiple books about physics. So asking him the question, what is time? seem to be a good place to start. Well, time is something where people start complaining about how vague it is when they start thinking about it. And I actually push back against that a little bit. I think it's not that complicated what time is. Of course, there might be unanswered questions about the fundamental nature of reality. But for my purposes, we live in a universe where we locate things using space and time. Space is where things are. Time is when things are. So the universe is something that has space full of stuff. And that space full of stuff happens over and over again. Time is the label that tells us which of those moments we are living in and talking about. Right. It's something we measure with our clocks. Um, would you mind just talking us through how time is treated in physics? I mean, physics is our best description of reality. So what does physics tell us about time? Time actually gets complicated when the physicists come into the game, unfortunately. Uh, it was back in the day, if you were Isaac Newton or one of his compatriots, there was basically an idea of what time was that we all agreed on. Everyone's clocks, if they were working, measured the same thing. When relativity came along, we realized that if people's clocks were moving in different ways through the universe, they would measure different amounts of elapsed time. And that's perfectly okay. It's just like space. You know, if you walk on a straight line and I walk on a curved path, we will take different amounts of distance to travel between two points. And relativity says time is like that. And that's part of the fact that time is unified with space into space-time, which then general relativity, Einstein's next big theory in 1915, says has a geometry of its own and we experience that as gravity. So space and time turn into something that is really relevant to the forces of nature that we know about in our everyday lives. So general relativity, unlike quantum mechanics, says time is relative. And if you buy the theory of the block universe, where all space and time exist simultaneously, then time doesn't flow. But why do we experience time flowing? Is it likely to just be an illusion? 
time is a coordinate on space time. It doesn't flow as a fundamental feature any more than space flows. We have an impression that time flows because entropy is increasing, which gives us the arrow of time, whereas there's no arrow of space. But that doesn't mean it's an illusion. Space can be just as real as time is. So I think that time is real, but the idea that we are propelled through it by some sense of flow is just a consequence of our macroscopic existence in a world where entropy is going up. Okay, can we just talk through this entropy business? Entropy is a way that physicists have of talking about the disorderliness, the randomness, the disorganization of some system. The early universe near the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, it turns out when you run the numbers, was very, very low entropy, was very, very special, was very, very organized and non-random. And it's been sort of relaxing and getting more random and more disorganized ever since. And you might think that that's just a, a story of decay and disruption, right? If everything's just getting more random. But along the way, one of the ways that the universe makes more entropy is to create little pockets of orderliness like you and me. And we're doing our job by talking and sweating and moving things around to actually increase the entropy of the universe. Because basically the way to think about entropy is entropy is a way of counting how many ways there are to arrange your atoms without changing the overall look and feel of an object. So if things are sort of separate, if there's cream and coffee that are separated from each other, you can mix up the cream within itself or the coffee within itself and everything is fine. But once they're all mixed together, there's vastly more ways to rearrange the atoms because they're all mixed up with each other. So that's a higher entropy configuration and that's where the universe goes. So the simple idea is just entropy increases over time because there are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. So coffee and cream mixed together is a more disordered state, which has higher entropy than coffee and cream existing separately. And because entropy is constantly increasing in the universe, it is possible to mix cream and coffee, but not separate the two once mixed. John Wheeler, who's a famous physicist, said that he always felt bad about pouring milk into his tea because he was increasing the entropy of the universe and it would never go <laughs> back. But I don't think you should feel bad. It's going to happen one way or the other. So what has entropy got to do with time moving forward? It's crucially important. So that's a great question. And we have to separate out two things, what time is and how it behaves. So what time is, like I said, coordinate on space time, nothing to do with entropy. It's just a way of locating ourselves in the universe. But what makes time special is that there is a difference between the past and the future. There is certainly in our everyday perceptions an idea that we remember the past, but we can't affect it, right? I can't make a choice right now that changes the past, whereas choices I make right now can change the future in some way. That's a big difference. Why is there this difference? Ultimately, we think because entropy is increasing. But if entropy is always increasing, why do we think that the universe started in low entropy? Is that just an assumption? Man, I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, uh, this is slightly self-centered point of view, but my point of view is that I and a, a former student of mine, Jennifer Chen, we proposed a theory of cosmology that tried to explain why the early universe has low entropy. And I would argue two things. Number one, it is still the best, most logically sensible theory on the market. And two, it's a terrible theory. <laughs> now, I don't mean terrible in the sense that we're bad or even that it's not true, but there are so many sort of guesses and assumptions and fingers crossed. Hopefully this works out this way, right? I think that we had a very good idea and maybe it's even right, but there's so much we don't know. The current mm -hmm. state of the art is we just assume that the Big Bang or the, the state of the universe right after the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, it just was low entropy. And we don't have any consensus explanation for why that is. Many philosophers of science will say it's just a law of physics. That's just part mm -hmm. of the fundamental architecture. There's nothing more to be explained. Working cosmologists like myself would like to explain it. So Jenny Chen and I proposed that our universe is a baby universe that arose out of a bigger kind of universe, which is very exciting and something that in the case of universes, we don't know that much about. So no one can say we're wrong. That's always good. But on the <laughs> other hand, it's very hard to prove that we're right either. So I, I think this is a hugely important question that mm. cosmologists should really be paying attention to. If our universe is just part of many in a multiverse, 
it would make sense that it could have started with low entropy. I mean, there would be nothing special about it. Other universes could have started with other values of entropy, perhaps having different or even no errors of time. It's not a perfect explanation, though, not least because it is very difficult to test whether there are other universes. And while Sean reckons it is the most logical theory, that might not be the full story. I personally am very much on the side that says time does not flow, that this is kind of an illusion that comes from the way in which we ourselves happen to be embedded in the world, that there's nothing sort of in physics corresponding to that flow of time. Rather, we sort of time is a, a relative description in terms of where we happen to be located, but it's not a sort of fundamental feature of reality. That's Emily Adlam, a philosopher of physics at the Rotman Institute of Philosophy at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She studies physics and philosophy and is firmly in the camp that time does not flow. But there is an issue with this. Most physics equations and theories have time incorporated into them, with the assumption that it does flow. This is known as the time evolution paradigm, and it refers to the fact that both classical and modern physics have the letter T baked into the equations, allowing us to take any physical state and evolve it forward in time. So the time evolution paradigm is just this idea that the universe is generated by time evolution, that it's like a computer that takes a state and evolves it forwards in time. And for a very long time, all physical theories have been formulated like that. This idea has been that physical theory should work by giving you a set of states and some evolution laws, and it tells you how to generate the future from the past. And we're starting to move away from that a little bit in physics. Um, There have always been possible formulations of physical theories that don't take a time evolution form, but those have often not been taken very seriously. They've been regarded as sort of convenient mathematical descriptions rather than possible ways reality could be. But in modern physics, we have things like general relativity. We have things like the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. We have quantum gravity, which often doesn't seem very natural to write in a time evolution form. It's becoming more and more common to say that you know, maybe the time evolution formulation is not the most fundamental description. You know, It's a description that's convenient for us, but it, that might not be the way the world really works. Strangely, there is support for this view that time does not flow, even within existing theories of physics. So quantum mechanics, like classical mechanics, and like most of our physical theories, is time reversible. The equations will work in either direction of time. So there's nothing in the physics itself to say, well, things start at the beginning of time and evolve towards the other end. That's kind of an interpretation that we put on it based on our own experience of feeling like we are moving forwards in time. But that has really never been in in the physics. That has always been our interpretation. And modern physics is is increasingly putting strain on that picture because various parts of modern physics are looking harder and harder to sort of really properly accommodate in that time evolution picture. So we are being pushed towards having to take seriously the possibility that really this time evolution picture isn't the way things work at a fundamental level. It's the way that we perceive things as happening. So if there is no error of time, does that really mean that everything exists all at once? Yes. I mean, all at once is slightly metaphorical because from the sort of external, a temporal point of view, there's, there's no time at which things exist. Time is internal to the universe. Um, and from the external point of view, there's just no sort of meaningful notion of time or when things do or don't exist. But, but the thought is that rather than sort of starting at the beginning of time and generating the rest in some sort of process, you think of the universe as being selected and instantiated in a sort of timeless, atemporal way. This is the block universe theory, the idea that all time exists in equal status. And Emily has a unique way of explaining how that might work using a well-known game, Sudoku. The Sudoku metaphor is a sort of way of thinking about this idea of a block universe and all at once laws. So we often think of the laws of nature as being evolution laws. So the universe is something like a computer, which takes an initial state and generates the rest of history from that initial state. But there are other ways the laws of nature could be. They could be more like the rules of a game of Sudoku. So, you know, in Sudoku, the rules don't start from the left and move towards the right. The rules of Sudoku apply to the whole grid at once, and they just tell you whether a solution is valid or invalid. 
thought is that the laws of nature could work like that. Rather than evolving, they could simply single out entire courses of history and say, these courses of history are valid solutions, these courses of history are not valid solutions. So you just kind of select a whole solution in one go rather than generating it in a process. So Emily thinks that accepting that there is no flow of time, or in fact, maybe no time at all, can explain the conundrum of why the universe started out with such low entropy. In my view, a lot of the supposed problem comes from the time evolution picture, because in the time evolution picture, the only place you have any freedom to adjust anything is at the initial state. And so all the explaining has to come down to the initial state, and so you're kind of stuck with just postulating a low entropy initial state. My hope is that by moving to a non-time evolution picture, we give ourselves new possibilities to explain this kind of thing because we no longer have to put all the explanation at the start. So if I think that once we move away from the time evolution picture, that will lead to new ways of thinking about the arrow of time and about the increase of entropy. So when I recently wrote a book about thinking, I discovered that every language seems to talk about time differently. So in English, French and German, for example, people speak about time as if they are moving from the past to the future on this one dimensional line, you know, where every point is fixed. So you have no option but to move forward in time. But I discovered that other languages like Greek and Spanish, for example, they think about time as a volume instead. So they would use expressions like a big meeting rather than a long meeting as if points in times are floating around in a container, much like a block universe. But obviously most of physics was developed by English, German and French speakers. So does that beg the question of, you know, whether language or in particular those languages have held back our understanding of time? in physics. Yeah, definitely. I think that the language we have really places quite strong restrictions on how we think about things, and we may not even realize that. I think, for example, physicists very often talk about things in physics in causal terms. They want to say this event causes this event. This is the kind of causal structure that we're looking at. But causation as a concept is very strongly tied to this idea of sort of the flow of time. You know, causation is the past, cause is the future. And those sort of causal asymmetries don't really seem to be present in fundamental physics. This sort of flow is totally absent, and, and yet we still use causal language to talk about it, uh, which I think leads to a lot of confusions, leads to us conceptualizing fundamental physics in ways that don't really match its underlying structure. So there's a lot of work to be done in sort of untangling those things and trying to figure out what is really in the physics and what is just in our descriptions of it. Okay. And is the future written or not? Uh, so within the sort of block universe perspective, there's a sort of atemporal external sense in which the past and the future all exist at once and there's no sense in which the future is open. But of course, we ourselves are intrinsically located inside the block and from our point of view, the future is not yet written because you know we experience ourselves as being able to influence the future and not the past. So I think it's possible to have you know both things that from the external point of view, the future always exists and always has existed. But from our point of view, because of, of our specific perspective on the universe, the future remains open. In quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, yes, the same Schrodinger of the famous cat thought experiment, describes the state of a quantum system, such as a particle, over time. While its treatment of time is rather intuitive, the rest of the theory is not. Until you actually make a measurement of a quantum system, such as finding out a particle's location, it is neither here nor there. It is in what physicists call a superposition. That's a mix of many different locations at the same time, all with different probabilities. This is just utterly bizarre, and it seems to indicate that nature isn't real. You know, that objects don't exist until we actually measure them. In fact, that's what Schrodinger was trying to tell us by forcing us to imagine a cat being dead and alive at the same time. Another weird thing in the theory is that a particle isn't just directly influenced by its immediate surroundings, as you would expect. It can be entangled or spookily connected with another particle, so that if you manipulate one of them, you instantaneously influence the other, even if it is at a different side of the universe. This is called non-locality. But there is a way to get rid of these strange features of the theory. They actually exist because we've made certain assumptions, including that cause and effect have to flow forward in time, 
which makes sense. A glass falls over, it breaks. But if we allow it for cause and effect to flow backwards, at least in the quantum realm, with the future literally influencing the past, quantum mechanics could be both real and local. It's a bit like picking your poison. Do you prefer that nature is random and seemingly unreal, or do you prefer time flowing backwards? It's anything but simple. But how could we even begin to make sense of time flowing backwards? I mean, I think there's two different ways people think about this idea of retrocausality and influences backwards in time. Um, and one is this sort of picture where there's like two distinct independent arrows of causation, one going forwards and the other going back and they kind of collide or interact. And that I think is kind of a mistake that's sort of conceptually, it's very hard to make that work. Um, and that kind of relies on a temporal flow like Pictia, which is hard to reconcile with modern physics. But on the other hand, if you think of a less sort of flow based Pictia and you think of events sort of coming into being in an all at once way, then you would kind of expect to see events at different times influencing each other in a, in a more mutual reciprocal way. So in that sense, the past would influence the future, but the future would also influence the past in a symmetric way. So in that sense, I think the future can influence the past, but not in the sense of sort of distinct, separable arrows of causation. Okay, so what is the problem with the first option? Why is that hard to reconcile? Well, basically, because if you have distinct and independent arrows of causation, your causation from the future can contradict your causation from the past, and you can end up with basically logical paradoxes that become really hard to reconcile. Uh, it's a bit like the sort of traditional grandfather paradox, which is an issue in the philosophy of time travel, where a time traveler goes back in time and kills their own grandfather, and there's no way to make that course of events become logically coherent. And you can have the same kind of problem if you have separate and independent arrows of causation, right? I could use a backwards in time influence to cause one of my grandparents to die before they can have any children, and then I myself wouldn't exist, so I couldn't have done that. And so if you allow those kinds of independent arrows of causation, you end up with contradictions. Whereas you think of things being arranged all at once in a sort of mutual reciprocal way, then you can just demand logical consistency as an overall global condition, and you won't get contradictions. Mm. So if this kind of view that time doesn't really flow, that all the times exist at the same time, you know, if that's true, then do we have free will in that picture as our future kind of exists now? I think that we don't really have free will in the strong sense that some people would like even in the standard evolution based picture, right? Because in the standard evolution based picture, uh, everything you do now is you're fully determined by the initial stage way back in the mists of time, or alternatively in quantum mechanics, maybe it's random, but either way, it's not sort of you making those choices. I actually think in the all at once picture, it's a bit more friendly to free will than the standard evolution-based picture, because in the evolution-based picture, your whole life is fully determined by things that happened long ago, and you really have no input into it. Whereas in the all at once picture, it's not the case that the past causes the future and not vice versa. There's no sort of place in time, which is the origin of everything. All moments in time are really equal. And therefore, your actions in the present cause the rest of history just as much as the rest of history causes your actions. And in that sense, there's a more sort of participatory feeling to it that what you are doing now really is part of determining the course of history rather than everything being determined long back in the you know the early universe. But what does Sean Carroll think about free will? It depends very much, sadly, on your definition of free will. And that's something that we don't agree about. You know, I'm very firmly in the camp that says that we human beings obey the laws of physics. There's a way of talking about us as giant collections of elementary particles obeying the laws of physics. And in that way of talking, there is no room for free will. Whether or not time is real or emergent, whether or not the universe is deterministic or indeterministic, there are laws of physics that say what happens. But I also recognize that there is a much more convenient way to talk about human beings when actual human beings are actually talking to each other. We do not list all of our atoms or tell each other our quantum state. We give our age and our occupation and our stories, etc. We talk at the level of macroscopic emergent organisms and agents. And at that level, the ability to make choices on the basis of information is crucially important and real. I think free will is real as long as we're talking at the level of human beings. You're listening to Great Mysteries of Physics from The Conversation. We've heard so far about two different ways of thinking about time, 
One is that time is absolute and universal and moving in one direction. The other is what Emily explained with her Sudoku metaphor, that everything is equal and happens all at once, meaning the future may influence the past, just as vice versa. But both of these theories are just that, theories. To know whether a theory is correct, it needs to be tested experimentally. Enter Natalia Aris, an associate professor of engineering at Oxford University in the UK. Natalia thinks that improving our understanding of clocks may help us to understand time better. She has completed an experiment uncovering a link between timekeeping and thermodynamics, which is the science of heat and work. It is in fact the laws of thermodynamics which states that entropy in a closed system should always increase. We use clocks as machines that measure time and we have some tools to understand thermodynamics of machines and the limitations that govern those machines. So by understanding clocks as machines, there are things that we can understand better about what are the limits of time keeping in terms of thermodynamic resources. So uh, basically, in our experiment, we build a clock in which uh, fluctuations are important. So it's a membrane that has a width of 50 nanometers or so. And what we did was to basically measure the displacement of this membrane, how this membrane moves as a function of time. By applying electricity? or Yeah, so the way we excite the membrane motion is by feeding white electrical noise to the limitations of experimental setups, which means some noise that basically heats up the membrane. And when the membrane heats up, it starts moving, resonating at its resonance frequency. And we can use that as a clock because it's like a pendulum, right? Every time that reaches its maximal amplitude, we can say, well, that's a tick. And this would be a periodic tick with with certain accuracy, right? So a more accurate clock has more regular ticks. But Natalia and her team were not trying to make a really accurate clock. The idea was to build a clock in which we can actually measure what is the accuracy and at the same time, what is the resources that we input into the clock. So in this case, we are inputting electrical noise to effectively heat up the membrane and we know exactly how much of this electrical signal we input to make the membrane move and and we can measure at the same time how accurate this clock is. So now we have, you know, an input resource, some waste that it's dissipated in the circuit and a clock that it's more or less accurate. But we can basically correlate the resources that we input into the system, the power of the electrical signal we input, and the accuracy of our clock. And what we find is that the more resources in terms of electrical signal that we input into the system, the more accurate the clock. So basically, if you want a good clock, you need to pay for it in thermodynamic resources. So you need to input a bigger power in the system. And what's this got to do with entropy? Basically, what we realize is that if by increasing the power of the input signal, we have a more accurate clock and we have some dissipation in the circuit. What we realize is that this entropy production that results from this dissipation, it's proportional to the input resources. So the more resources we introduce into the circuit, the more entropy is dissipated and the more accurate the clock. So accuracy creates entropy. Exactly. So if you want to measure time accurately, then you need to dissipate entropy. And the more accurate the clock, the more entropy you have to dissipate in order to achieve that accuracy. So does that mean there is a limit to this accuracy? So on our experiment, we weren't trying to get a very accurate clock. We just wanted to understand the limits. There seems to be that in order to have a very accurate clock, you need to produce more and more entropy. So naturally, one would think that that this is a limitation in terms of timekeeping. From the theory point of view, you have a limitation in terms of how accurate a clock can be because of the resources you have to input. At some point, the membrane starts to, let's say, dissipate this energy in different ways that do not make the clock more accurate. So we see that 
at some point, as we increase the thermodynamic resources, actually the uh, accuracy starts to plateau. You can drive a system very hard. So you can imagine, you know, uh, pushing a swing very hard and getting extremely big amplitudes in the motion of that swing. But that has a limit, right? At some point, <laughs> something is going to break. And the same happens with our membrane. So there is a limit in terms of how large the resource can be to achieve a, a given accuracy. Natalia has shown that the more accurate a clock is, the more entropy it creates. This seems to suggest that the error of time isn't just an illusion created by the human brain. It is actually a necessary physical consequence of measuring time with clocks. So even an AI or a detector would see an increase in entropy when measuring time, and thus time moving forward, with ticks appearing rather than disappearing. And this seems to be compatible with the idea that the error of time emerges from the laws of thermodynamics on our human scale. But perhaps more importantly, physical theories such as relativity just assume that clocks are infinitely accurate. Natalia has shown that isn't the case. There are fundamental limits to what they can do. So learning more about the mechanics of clocks may therefore be helpful if we ultimately want to understand time and improve our theories. Let's go back to Emily. So within this kind of block universe type picture of time, clocks play in a really important role because in that picture, time essentially comes down to the relations between observers and clocks. You know, all that time means is that you are observing a certain reading on a clock and then other versions of you are, are observing different readings on clocks. So clocks are kind of the way in which we get access to this parametrization of, of the universe. They are a way of sort of learning about our position in the universe and of describing the way in which change appears to happen in this universe because if nothing is really flowing then change just comes down to things being different relative to different clock readings. One way to probe the nature of time would be to experimentally test theories of everything such as quantum gravity. If versions of quantum gravity which have no time are experimentally verified this could suggest time is an illusion. Annoyingly though Testing quantum gravity would require immense amounts of energy, more than is currently available even with our best accelerators. But there are shortcuts. You can combine aspects of general relativity and quantum mechanics and then test them at lower energies. For example, some researchers are looking at building quantum clocks, tiny devices perhaps the size of a single particle, or other quantum systems, to see whether gravity can influence or at least be felt in such systems. And there have been some exciting results suggesting it can. Chiara Marletto and Vlatko Vedral from the University of Oxford in the UK have come up with an interesting idea for a future experiment. They want to test whether two masses, such as tiny crystals, could become entangled, spookily connected according to the rules of quantum mechanics, by having gravity, and only gravity, acting on them. This would suggest that gravity could truly have quantum effects, again helping to marry the two theories of quantum mechanics and general relativity. And it would involve putting the masses in a superposition, where they will be in a mix of different locations simultaneously. But remember, according to general relativity, locations are events in space-time, not just events in space, meaning the experiment would actually produce a sort of superposition of different times. While this isn't an experiment that physicists are able to perform today, it could be worth waiting for. If clocks could indeed be in a superposition of ticking at different rates simultaneously, it would suggest that the treatment of time as absolute in quantum mechanics isn't correct or fundamental, but that time is instead just relative to a given clock, as in general relativity. Of course, experiments aren't everything. In my view, the problem is not lack of experimental evidence. The problem is more conceptual, that we have a bunch of bad assumptions about time that have gone into the formulation of our theories, and there's a 
a lot of work to be done to remove those assumptions and figure out what things look like once all those assumptions are gone. And it's my hope that by removing those assumptions, we will sort of see a clearer path in front of us, particularly towards how to unify quantum mechanics and relativity. And once that's done, there may be sort of ideas for what appropriate experiments would be to find out more. But you know, at this point, I think the conceptual work needs to be done before we will even know which experiments to perform. Right. So you think the best way forward is to just strip time out of quantum out of general relativity and put the two together in a framework, a theory of everything that doesn't have time. So actually figuring out time and removing our assumptions about time might be the key to uniting these two notoriously difficult to reunite branches. Yeah, and there are already a bunch of research programs that are kind of making progress on this where there is less time. But I think there are a lot of sort of phrases that we use in our language that sort of implicitly draw on the assumption of some background time and those things make their way into physics too. And that makes it quite hard to be sure that we have really fully removed our ideas of time from our physics. They they tend to sort of creep back in. So maybe the removal of time in equations could be the solution to making general relativity and quantum mechanics match up. I put this to Sean to see what he thought. My own personal interests these days are in the macroscopic, classical, complex systems part of the world. But the other part, which I do think is fascinating, is the emergence of space-time itself from quantum mechanics. And I do think that there's something to be asked even without changing the fundamental nature of time. You know, in the Schrodinger equation, time, the letter T, appears as a fundamental variable. And I'm sort of slow and simple-minded enough that my first strategy is just to keep it there and see how space emerges. But that might not work. It might be necessary to understand at a deeper level how time also emerges at the same time, as it were. So again, I think that uh, this is all stuff we're kind of flailing around about. There's a lot of good ideas out there, but nothing has really caught on as obviously right. So let a thousand flowers bloom in this particular area. But couldn't that just be an indication that, you know, we're so obsessed with times and we can't get it right because ultimately it is just an illusion? I don't think that time is an illusion. I don't think it's any more an illusion than the desk in front of me is an illusion. Back in the day, we realized that this desk is not a fundamental feature of reality. It's constructed from a bunch of atoms and molecules held together by the world of quantum mechanics. But the desk didn't stop existing or being real once we learned it was made of atoms. We might learn that time is emergent out of some more fundamental phenomenon, but that doesn't make it an illusion. When we scheduled this interview, I needed to know it was 9 a.m. Eastern time when we did it. And I was not intimidated by that. I was not didn't need to solve any equations to figure out what was there. Time is clearly real and important. It might not be fundamental, but I'm not worried about getting rid of time as part of my description of the world. We're getting to the end of this episode, which is clearly different from the beginning. Hopefully we know more now, or maybe we've just got a headache. As Sean and Natalia have explained, one reason we may experience the beginning coming before the end is that entropy is rising in the universe. What's really going on beneath the surface is difficult to tell. Philosophers and scientists suspected atoms existed thousands of years before they were actually discovered. They then uncovered that atoms were made up of even smaller particles called quarks. Perhaps as we zoom in even more, there is something else. And perhaps there is no time in this enigmatic world. Perhaps it's a Stuka universe as Emily suggested. Could we find out by simply removing our notion of time, stripping it out of our equations entirely? Or will experiments to probe timekeeping, clocks and quantum gravity unveil the truth? Most likely, we'll need them all. As we've heard about in this episode, the conundrum of why the universe started in low entropy is a real headache for physicists. Such assumptions are what we'll be talking about in the next episode. Why do the fundamental constants in physics, which ultimately determine the sizes and strength of all the masses and forces in the cosmos, take the values they do? Values that ultimately allow life to evolve. Is it all just a lucky coincidence that we're here? Or is there something more mysterious going on? This 
This podcast was created and presented by me, Miriam Frankel, and produced by Hannah Fisher. The executive producers are Joe Adetunji and Gemma Ware, and the advisory editor is Zia Morali. The sound design is by Eloise Stevens, and the music is by Nita Sarl. Grape Mysteries of Physics is a podcast from The Conversation UK with funding from FQXI. That was episode one of Great Mysteries of Physics. Links to more information about the series and accompanying articles at The Conversation UK, along with more on the ideas discussed here, can be found on FQXI's podcast page, which now has a new home, at qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts. That's the letter Q followed by the word space. So Q S P A C E dot fqxi.org slash podcasts. Or you could just go to fqxi.org and click on the Q space button. And if you haven't visited fqxi.org recently, you'll see it looks quite different. You'll be hearing more episodes from the series through our podcast, along with our usual mix of discussions of big ideas in physics. You can still reach me at podcast at fqxi.org or on Twitter at fqxi, where Miriam can also be found at Miriam Frankel. We're at fqxi on LinkedIn and on YouTube, where you can watch a short film in which Natalia Ares takes us around her Oxford lab to show us more of those experiments she spoke about. And we're at FQXI Physics on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and Pinterest. In the meantime, please do visit FQXI.org and our accompanying site QSpace.FQXI.org for more information about how to enter FQXI's new essay competition with a $40,000 prize pot that asks how science could be different. You'll be hearing more about the essay competition in future episodes of this podcast. But for now, thank you for listening. I've been Zia Morali. <laughs>